Okay, hello. We are interviewing uh, Justice Mary Yu, who is running for re-election as Washington State Supreme Court Justice. Um, feel free to give us an introduction. You have two minutes. Great. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be interviewed tonight. Uh, I feel like the 36th is, uh, is known to me and I to you, I hope. Um, I've been now on the Supreme Court for eight years, and prior to that, I was in the King County Superior Court for 14 years. So um, again, I feel like I have been around for some time, having been a judge now for 22 years. Um, I am running again because I think my voice makes a difference. Uh, when I was first appointed to the court uh, by Governor Inslee, I was the first woman of color to serve on the state Supreme Court. Um, it seemed remarkable to me then uh, that it came so late uh, in our state's history, but nevertheless, I was pleased. Um, I still think that my voice matters at the table. I'm proud to be Latina, Asian, and a member of the LGBTQ community. And while I have been joined by other women of color, I still think uh, critical mass matters and my presence does matter. Um, I would uh, let you know that I am co-chair of the Minority and Justice Commission. I also am co-chair of the Leadership Institute, which focuses on leadership development for lawyers from underrepresented communities. I co-chair our Rules Committee, and I continue to be involved with uh, mock trials and teach at Seattle University School of Law. So. It's a very brief introduction, and I'm happy to answer any question. Very much appreciate that. Um, we are going to uh, have four prepared questions. Again, you have two minutes to answer each one. Um, and um, I'll start with the first one. Um, what are the elements of your background and experience that make you the best qualified uh, candidate to earn our endorsement? What is your experience serving as a judge slash justice pro tem or within the judicial system and how will this inform your perspective on the bench? Well, I think what I just mentioned about my background uh, is primary, uh, primarily really a source of information and a place or a touchstone, if you will, of why I think I'm the best candidate. I think it's important to have appellate judges who actually have been at the trial court to understand uh, what a trial judge does, um, how to make quick decisions, and most of the things that we're reviewing, frankly, come from matters that occur actually in the trial court in terms of a jury trial. So I think that's one uh, important um, touchstone. The second, as I mentioned, my own background. Um, I came from a working class background in Chicago, and I'm very sensitive uh, to working class individuals and the opportunities that were given to me to get to where I am now. That remains a something that I am very proud of, but it also makes me very sensitive to how economics and poverty come into play within our court system uh, significantly. As a minority uh, female, I'm very sensitive also to the question of race. The fact that our criminal justice system continues to feed uh, incarceration rates that have a disparate impact on minority populations will always be something very important to me. So those are just a, a few of the things that I think I bring to the table that are unique. I don't have an opponent, so it's not like I can compare myself to somebody else, but I think those unique attributes um, are why I believe I would be the best candidate to continue serving on your court. All right, thank you. Um, second question, Alice, do you wanna take the second one? Sure. How would you further equity and access to justice for all as a justice? Please provide specific examples of how you have furthered equity and access in your work and judicial decisions. Yeah, I would say not only in my writing and opinions have I done so, and I think our court has been a leader in the nation on right now looking at race uh, and social justice. I am proud to have been the author of the letter that the court wrote in June of 2020 that has gotten a lot of publicity, a lot of play, but more importantly, it has been serving as the driving force uh, for our courts to begin the self-reflection of what is it that we need to do to eradicate racism. As co-chair of the Minority and Justice Commission, uh, we have led uh, the entire state in judicial education because that's where it begins. Um, we offer premier programs on anti-bias training and now we're looking at again, eradicating racism, naming it as it is. We have an upcoming symposium on June 1st that will look at reparations for black Americans. Um, and that's just an example of uh, some of the educational things that I've been involved with. 
I will continue oh. to serve as co-chair unless I'm removed by the court. But uh, that is uh, very important to me. Okay, thank you. Um, question number three, Barbara, do you wanna take that one? Yes, happy to. How would you define restorative justice? To what extent are you committed to incorporating principles of restorative justice in your judicial philosophy and in your decisions? Well, you know, restorative justice is really something that um, is more relevant at the trial court level. At the appellate level, we can endorse it, we can support it, we can encourage judges to find alternatives uh, to bringing victims and defendants together so that there really truly is restorative justice and that is people being made whole. We know because we hear from victims that say this process, even if you find somebody guilty, doesn't really help bring resolution to the injury or pain that, that may have been inflicted on them. And the same is true for a defendant, especially a juvenile who really, what will they learn by the process that we have now? I think very little. Punishment is not the only way to really help people understand the implications in terms of what they do. So what we can do is encourage trial court judges to be open. The one thing that works with restorative justice if both consent to it. It can't be something that's forced on one without the other for it to truly work. So we can encourage judges and prosecutors to really explore expanding these opportunities to look at doing something other than incarcerating people. Um, if there's a chance to write about it, I would write about it, but you know, we don't always have the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Clayton, do you want to take the fourth question? Um, please provide an example of how you balance the ju judicial principle of stare decisis or adherence to precedent with the rapidly changing society and advancements in racial, economic, social, and climate justice in your judicial decision making. Yeah, thank you for that question. I like talking about that because um, our court recently just issued a very important decision, State v. Blake. Um, and in our own jurisprudence in the state of Washington, we are required to find that some a case is incorrect and harmful before we can reverse. Well, this was a case which we did that. And many people were critical to say, but that was precedent, that was stare decisis. How is it that you can now change the law 35 years later? And here's how we changed the law. And that is 35 or so years ago, our court said that it was okay that the state did not have to prove that somebody knowingly possessed drugs, right? In every criminal case, one of the things that is the hallmark of our democracy is that the defendant has no burden of proof, that the state is the one who is required to prove all the elements of a crime. But our court years ago said, well, the way that we're gonna deal with this is a defendant can actually prove unwitting possession. We'll allow them to argue that they unwittingly possessed it. When we revisited that doctrine 35, 36 years later, our court recognized that that holding, frankly, was incorrect and harmful. It was contrary to the constitutional principles that the defendant did not have to prove anything. And we reversed in that case. Now, we didn't go pick the case. That was a case that came to us on appeal from Spokane. But we said the state has the obligation and the duty to prove all elements of the case. And we reversed and said that burden belongs on the state, not the defendant. That is unconstitutional. Now, when we declare something unconstitutional, what does that mean? It means it's retroactive as a matter of law. And so what happened is a lot of people in prison, right, had, had to be resentenced. A lot of people could come in and say, I want my uh, background cleared because this is no longer, right, a legitimate conviction. It upset a lot of people. And yet at the same time, the legislature accepted it. The legislature appropriated $50 million to help state trial courts do the resentencing. And the fact is, it took head on the whole issue of disproportionality because the war on drugs really had a disparate impact on people of color. So those were the primary people who were impacted by the law. Those are the primary people who were incarcerated. And so for me, when I look at, yeah, we had the opportunity to correct a prior error of law that our court made, I think it's okay to do that. 
Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna move to eboard questions. These are not prepared questions. These are just questions that the eboard may have. Again, you have one minute to answer those. Uh, any questions from the eboard? Yeah, Sarah. There was recently, as you know, a, a leak of a potential Supreme Court <laughs> a decision or draft Supreme Court decision uh, that it appears would completely overturn Roe v. Way. So I'm going to keep this general, but I'm just interested if you have thoughts um, on that decision, the judicial decision making or anything else about that. Yeah, gosh, it's so complicated because I mean, and again, I'm just sort of surmising. People wonder whether it was a leak or <laughs> whether it was an intentional uh, early distribution. Um, I have not had an opportunity today to read um, that draft opinion. And so much really will rest on how and the rationale for how they decide where to go on uh, abortion. Um, do they declare it unconstitutional? Do they really just correct something that they see needs correction? A lot is going to depend on what they decide. They can actually write something that would preclude any state um, from responding in a legitimate legal way. On the other hand, it's hard for me to believe that they would go that far, that they may actually end up where it appears this draft is going is to say it belongs to another branch of government or it belongs to the states. If it belongs to the states, then anything can happen in the state of Washington in terms of protecting somebody's right to choose. Thank you. Uh, Clayton, question. Uh, yes. Um, yesterday's uh, draft decision by Justice Alito uh, seems, to, seems to have at its core uh, the the um, relationship between the states and and federal government, which reminds me of the theory of nullification, mm -hmm. and the and the uh, problem problems that it out that it brought forth uh, in the Jackson administration in eighteen thirty one thirty two. Uh, so all of that seems a brief time ago, 15 minutes ago to me, because the issues are the same. The issues are the mandatory returning to the states of issues of crucial importance to individual citizens. Please comment. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, and I have different feelings today than I have had in the past, in the sense of um, I really believed, right, that most of the uh, important social issues um, needed to be resolved at a federal level by federal courts in order to have uniformity. Um, the more that the union changed and the more the polarization grew and the more disenchantment, frankly, with the United States Supreme Court, I have to admit that as a state Supreme Court justice, Part of me thought that perhaps we could really deliver justice better at the state level with state Supreme Courts, um, that there would be a way that we could interpret our state constitutions because we're the only ones who can do so that would ensure fundamental, fundamental individual rights will be protected. I don't like the idea of a disjointed 50 checkered pattern country uh, in these laws at seconds. the same time. At the same time, um, I have to just say that I trust the process and how we would arrive at decisions in the state of Washington in terms of our state constitution. And even if it's an interim time, um, I feel very comfortable that states would have that power. It's a complicated topic. I'm so sorry to say it's hard to answer in a short, uh, a short time period. The question's not really fair, but, <laughs> but it's a good one, I think. <laughs> Um, we got time for a couple more, maybe two more. Sherry. Hi. Um, sorry, if I do my video, I may not stay. But I was reading, um, I've seen a couple of editorials in the Seattle Times about this uh, Supreme, about this uh, open records issue with uh, juvenile records being can you comment on that? It's something I have a hard time understanding. Absolutely. Um, I'm proud that it was the Minority and Justice Commission that joined the Office of Public Defense in proposing the rule that is such a controversial rule right now, according to some people. What it does is, one, 
Um, it doesn't allow juvenile records to be put on the internet. Um, we have been trying to argue this for the longest of time, uh, that there was no good to be done uh, when somebody can just surf the internet and look at juvenile records in terms of giving them a second chance. The other is that it would simply require in court records and court filings that an initial be used, initials rather than the full name. Um, and frankly, the controversy that is in the paper and that is claimed by many of our own justice partners are that it can't be done and there's no way that we could identify these individuals when in fact, numbers are assigned to every juvenile. There is a way seconds. to track everybody. And so, so much of this isn't true. The rule does not disturb warrant status. The rule does not disturb the ability for criminal justice agencies to communicate about real names and real people. So I have to admit that I'm distressed by what I see as frankly misinformation about the rule. This is about giving juveniles a second chance and giving them some privacy uh, when they're coming through the juvenile justice system. So thank you for asking that question. Sorry, um, just to keep us on time, we've got time for you to give a uh, one minute closing. Um, and uh, again, thank you. Great. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm proud of the work that our court has done. And I recognize that not everybody can have a deep appreciation for some of the things that we have done. And yet I think our court feels a deep, deep obligation and duty to try to correct some of our systems that have just frankly not resulted in justice. I'm committed to doing that. I want to do that. I think we can have a fair and accessible system of justice. And I remain committed to doing that uh, for the next term if I can be elected. So I just ask you to please uh, study me, get to know me more and understand that I am very sincere in my efforts to serve you and to advance justice. Thank you. Thank All right, you. Justice, you thank you so much. We're gonna turn the recording off and